Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Man, I love being here with you guys. I hope you never take for granted what God's doing in this place. Because, you know, it doesn't happen like this everywhere. You know, there are folks going to places and churches where they just feel like they have to be perfect to be accepted, and and they know they don't meet up, and so they put on a funny face and act like there's something they're really not. And I just love the fact that you can come here and be who you really are, right? Messed up and all, right? How many messed up people here this morning? And my hand's up first, right? Okay. You know, Jesus, we, we say Jesus came for everybody, but he himself said he didn't. He said, I only came for sinners. That's me. You know, he came for me. He came for you. He didn't come for the righteous. He said, I only came to call sinners. Man, the righteous don't even know they need him, right? They think they're righteous, right? So anyway, God's doing great things here, and I always just love it. You know, uh, it comes some point in your life when you become your kid's dad, right? You know, it used to be he was my son, but now I'm, I'm Joel's dad. So yeah, uh, we're uh, just delighted to be here with you guys, and thank you for having me back again, and I just love to share with you. So um, yeah, so, so today, um, we're going to look at... Uh, uh, the book of Judges, and the book of Judges is a pretty weird book. I mean, it is a strange book. Uh, we're going to look at the first chapter of it, and I'm going to ask you a question. We'll need to look at the book of Judges to figure out how to answer this question. Um, and here's the question we're, we want to discover. What is the iron chariot in your life? What is the iron chariot in your life? We're going to look at Judges chapter 1, and after we do that, it'll make a little bit more sense. And uh, we're going we're to um, learn some things from that. And Judges is... It is a weird book, as I said, but you know, one of the things I love about the book of Judges is um, it doesn't matter how messed up you are. Sometimes we feel like, man, I'm just too messed up. I got too many problems. God can never use me. Or maybe I'm, I'm messed up because others have messed me up. I'm too messed up to be used by God. And if you ever feel that way, if you ever feel like I've messed up too bad, I've failed too much, I've sinned too big, I'm, I'm too big of a mess that God could ever use me, read the book of Judges. Because when you read the book of Judges, you go, oh my gosh, I'm not that messed up. You know, I'm, I'm really, you say, well, you don't know me, I am that man. No, no, no. You know, in the book of Judges, there was a priest who his wife died. He cut her up into 12 parts and mailed her to every district in the country. Are you that messed up? Don't answer. Okay. (laughs) That's pretty messed up, isn't it? I mean, the point is, God uses messed up people. In fact, I am convinced that he is most glorified when he uses the least qualified. Say, I'm in that category. He could use me, right? And we're going to see this in the book of Judges here. We're just going to start off because there's something in the first chapter that kind of you look at it and you go, what happened here? I'm not sure what's going on. So um, Judges chapter 1 starts off like this. Now, to get the, the, the timing, it starts off saying after the death of Joshua. So we know when this book took place, you know, the children of Israel brought out of Egypt. Moses led them out of Egypt, led them up to the promised land. God has said, I've given you this land Go in and possess it, inherit it. You're gonna, I've already given the land to you. So all they had to do was move into the land and take it, right? But they sent in these 12 spies. And the 12 spies, you're probably familiar with that story, they, they came back and all 12 of them had the same report. It's a good land. But after that, 10 of them said, yeah, but there are giants in that land. I mean, we're like grasshoppers in their side. They're going to squish us if we move in there. We, we can't do it. And Joshua and Caleb said, yeah, it's a good land, but God is with us. Yeah, they're big, but, and we may be like grasshoppers, but we got a God who's going to squish them. Amen. And so let's move in and do it. Well, unfortunately, they follow the majority. You know, in the Bible, almost always the majority is wrong. Now, I don't know what that says for us that's a country that's run by majority rule, but you take that for what it's worth. The majority is almost always wrong in Scripture. Because they're always following what makes sense and what's logical instead of following God. And so they, they, they were told they would inherit this land and they, because of unbelief, lost it. And so they ended up wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. God said, okay, I'll raise up a new generation. You just go out there and you live your little lives and you die and then we'll try again with the next generation. And uh, I, I think sometimes I've seen people that are the same way, you know, because of lack of unbelief. They don't lose their salvation. They're not going to hell, but they just kind of wander around in their life, just sort of never really inheriting all that God has for them. 
never, even though he says I've already given it, they never really take hold of it and possess it because of unbelief or fear or whatever. And so that's that generation. Joshua comes along. He leads them into the land. They're starting to conquer the land. They're taking, making victories and overcoming. And, and, and then Joshua dies. And that's where the book of Judges comes in now. And so that's, that's the scenario. That's the setting. And here's what happens in Judges 1. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, who is to go up first for us? Who's going to lead us now? Joshua's passed away. Who's going to lead us now? And the Lord answered them. He said, Judah shall go up, for I have given the land into their hands. It's the same promise he had made to these people's parents and grandparents. I've given the land into Judah's hands. Go up with them. It's already given to you. Just you, All you have to do is go and possess it. You got the title deed. I've given it to you. Go take it. Okay, so the next few verses, everything's going good. Boy, they're going in and they're conquering this and they're conquering that and they're driving back the enemies of God and they're winning the battles and all that stuff. For 18 verses, everything goes good. But then they hit a wall. Something happens. That's Judges 1.19. Jump down to there if you're reading with me there. It says, the Lord was with Judah and they took possession of the hill country. That's a great place to take possession of, isn't it? The hill country. They took that, but... But, 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 but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the plains because they had chariots of iron. So on the mountaintop, they did good. Man, they won the victories. They drove back the, the, the enemies of God up there. But that's not all God had given them. He had given them the plains, too. He had given them these other areas, this fertile plains. But they looked down there, and the inhabitants of that had chariots of iron. And so all of a sudden... They become just like their parents and grandparents going, whoa. Their parents and grandparents said, giants, we can't take giants. Now they're looking and they're going, ooh, iron chariots. We, we can't beat iron chariots. And now Judah has a critical decision to make. What are they going to do? Are they going to go to war and risk being defeated by iron chariots, trusting God that God's going to give them victory? Or are they just going to, well, they make the wrong choice, what they decide to do. And for the rest of that chapter, you read over and over again, they couldn't drive out this group, and so they made peace with them and became neighbors with them. They couldn't drive out this group, and so they made peace with them and became neighbors with them. And they, it was kind of a, hey, look, we'll leave you alone if you leave us alone. And they just sort of made peace with it. And uh, that ultimately led to the downfall. Now, that's all wonderful, great story, good. What's that got to do with me, right? I got to get up in the morning, go to work, make cornflakes, whatever, you know. What's that got to do with me? Well, it's got everything to do with us. Because twice in the New Testament, it tells us that the things that happened to them in the Old Testament happened for us as words of encouragement, as warnings, and to give us hope. Twice it says that in the New Testament. That's what that Old Testament's all about. But to understand it, we need to understand some things that um, what, what God gives us in the Old Testament is pictures to help us understand spiritual truths in the New Testament. Let me give you an example you're probably familiar with. You know, there, there are things in the spiritual world that we really can't understand because it operates differently than our old carnal brains, our old fleshly brains. So to give us understanding in the spirit realm, he gives us pictures in the Old Testament in the physical realm. And one of those, everybody's familiar with probably, is the, the lamb. You know, they offered these lambs as sacrifices to cover up their sin. And so they would see this lamb offered and it would cover the sin. And that was this picture of what was coming in the spirit realm of the lamb of God, the innocent lamb of God, whose blood takes away the sin of the world. His death yes. takes away the sin of the world. And so that was a physical picture God gave them so they could go, oh, now I get it. I see how that works. And this taking of the promised land is the same way. It's a physical picture where they were to go in and drive back the enemies and possess the land that God had given, but it was a, spiritual, a physical picture of a spiritual truth. In the old days, there used to be these hymns about, like, you're, you're, you're going to die, and I'm going to go to the promised land, like heaven is the promised land. But heaven isn't a picture of the, the promised land is not a picture of heaven, because when we get to heaven, there aren't going to be giants to fight, there aren't going to be battles to win. It's going to be over with. The war is over with by that time. So what is this telling us? What is this giving us insight about? The promised land is really us, me. 
my soul, my, my will, my emotions, my understanding, my mind, my thoughts, and even my physical body. Right. And so here's what it is. It's like Jesus died to redeem us. This land has been given to us. I was in slavery to sin. I was a slave to sin. We were all slaves to sin. Jesus came, paid the price, bought us off the slave block. And he now says, you're a new creature in Christ. You're a new being, a new creature. But you know what? I still think and act and I still sort of feel oftentimes like the old creature. How about you? And it's like, I don't want it, but it, it's still there. There's still a lot of that old stuff inside here. And that's exactly what, it's, what this is a picture of. It's a picture of the Lord says, I have given you possession of the land, but you have to go in and take it. Good. You're a new creature. You now have a new mind, the mind of Christ, but you've got to take it. You've got to lay hold of it. In, in the New Testament terminology, Paul talked about it in Romans 12, where he says, I, I beseech you, I, I'm pleading with you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, present your bodies. Take that body that was an instrument of sin, and now it's to be an instrument of righteousness. Yeah, yeah. Take it, change it. Take possession of it. This, the enemy used to have it. It used to belong to him. But now, I've given it to you. But you need to possess it. And our mind, your emotions, your will, your intellect, those used to belong to the enemy. We used to think on things that pleased him. We used to think on things of the world. But now we're to be taking possession of it and converting it. And then that passage in Romans, present your body's living sacrifice. Be renewed in your mind. Don't be conformed to the world like you were over there. But get out of that form and now be conformed to the image of Christ by having your mind renewed. And so it's, a, it's a, the process of them taking um, the promised land is a picture of the process of us well, the, the, the theological term is sanctification, being conformed to the image of Christ. And it's a picture of us being day by day transformed in our thought life, in our emotional life, in our, in our physical bodies, what we do, being transformed and becoming more and more like Jesus. Yes. That's what possessing the promised land is. And so when we look at that parallel of that, we see that he says, I've given it to you. This now once belonged to the enemy, now it belongs to me. Now I need you to go in and take that land. I need you to go in and renew your mind and renew your emotions and renew the way you live your life and the way you view the world. I know when I first became a believer, I was like amazed. It was like things that I, the way I viewed things, just some of the things changed. Not everything, but there were some things that I'd look at that, it was, I just looked at it differently. Anybody relate to that? And, and then there were other things that I still looked at it the old way that needed to be changed. And then I found that as I walked with the Lord, some of the ways that had immediately changed, I kind of drifted back into seeing the world from that perspective again. And I was losing land. I was losing ground. You know, God had given it to me, but I let the enemy come in and take it back. And so that's what this is a battle of. And so we see in Judges 1 that they were doing good. Boy, they're driving back the enemy. They're being conformed to the image of Christ. They're taking possession of their soul. They're taking possession of the land. And then they hit a wall. And most of us have come up against something in our lives that we just don't seem to be able to get victory over. You know, and, and it may be one or two things. You know, I can remember when I was a young believer, I thought, man, if I can just get this out of my life, if I can just deal with this issue in my life, I'm going to be perfect. You know, I'm going to have it all together. Wow. And then down the road, a few years, I, I realized, wow, I've gained victory over that. But by then, God had shown me so many other things in my life that needed to be dealt with. Yeah? Yes. It's like an onion. You know, you peel away the outer layer and you figure it just keeps getting worse. As you get inside there and you see inside of you and you go, man, I'm a bigger mess than I thought I was. Thank you, Jesus, for not showing me how messed up I was to start off with. I'd have been just totally discouraged. I thought if I could just deal with these one or two things, little did I know that rotten to the core, you know, <laughs> that's why we're in the process of changing the core, you know, becoming conformed to the image of Christ. So that's what this is all about. Yeah. And it's all being conformed. And they made a crucial mistake. They decided instead of driving back the enemy, let's just make friends with them. Let's just make peace with them. Look, we won't bother you. If you won't bother us, we'll just live right next door to each other. 
But here's the thing. You can't make peace with the enemy. He is out to destroy you. And he, he, he will say, yeah, let's do that. That sounds good. Sounds good. But you know what? One of these days, one of these nights, he's going to slit your throat. You know, that, that's the way it works. You see that all the time when you see leaders in the church who've fallen or you see people, your brothers or sisters who've turned back. What happened? Well, it turns out that they didn't really destroy that enemy. They just made peace with him. And you know, here's the deal. When Jesus was in the wilderness, this is very crucial. When he was in the wilderness, he resisted the devil for 40 days. And so what did the devil have to do? James says, you resist the enemy. What? He has to flee. He had to. He had no choice. But he didn't give up. It says in there, it says, he left him for a more opportune time. And so what happens is Satan says, okay, Jesus, boy, he's on his game right now. I'm not going to be able to defeat him, but I'm going to step away. But I'm going to keep an eye on him. There'll be a time when he's discouraged, when he's depressed, when he's lonely. Maybe he's hungry. Maybe his blood sugar's down. It may just be something physical. But those are the times when I'll come back and I'll get him. And he, he, so he left him for a more opportune time. And that's what the enemy does. When we're battling, we're fighting, you know, and then you go, look, I'll, will you just make peace? And he goes, I'll make peace <laughs> till that opportune time. And then it's like, I'm going to take you out. Right. You can't make peace with the enemy. And that's what, I mean, we can get all bent out of shape looking at the physical picture. Oh, he sent him in. And he said, kill the little babies and kill everybody, destroy the whole. And we could go into all the theology of that and why that was the best thing to do and if you still don't agree with talk to God about it when you get there okay but the point is let's put all that aside and look at the physical the spiritual picture he was giving us what he was saying is this you can't even allow those little baby sins to live in your life because guess what they grow up and they become warriors that will kill you when they have the opportunity to and so what he's saying is you cannot play with sin you cannot play. And it, you cannot play with the devil. And here's the thing. A lot of times, I don't even think it's the devil. He's not my biggest problem. I think if the devil died yesterday, I wouldn't even know it. Because I got so much struggle with just me. Just the old nature inside of me. I'm my biggest enemy. And so I'm trying to possess my soul, my thought life, my emotions, my will, my desires, and my physical body to make them instruments of righteousness. Amen. Amen. And that's, that's what this is all about here. Anybody there right now? Yeah. yeah. Well, they, they made the crucial error of deciding to live with them because they saw these iron chariots and they said, oh, we, 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 we can't defeat that. I mean, we, that's amazing, we, we, powerful. That's a big enemy. I've, I've gone up against this thing in my life so many times and every time I fail and every time I fall I, 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 I can't defeat that I just may as well just give up and then we end up just trying to make peace with it and let me you know here's some iron chariots that I've seen like in my life and in other people's lives and just in walking with people through so many things sometimes an iron chariot can be like a habit that you have Something that you just don't seem to be able to break this habit, you know? And, and it might not even, it may be something that's evil, but it may not even be something evil. It's just something that's not beneficial for you. It's just not helpful for you. You know, Paul said this, he said, I can do all things are lawful for me. The law has been fulfilled. I'm not under the law. I've been set free from the law of sin and death. I'm set free from that. But not everything's beneficial for me. And then he repeated that. He goes, all things are lawful for me, but I'm not going to be controlled by anything. In other words, it may be okay. There's nothing evil or sin about this. But if it's controlling me, mm -mm, that's got no place in the child of God's life. Because I only want one controlling me. That's right. And if I got other things controlling me, even if they're not evil, they, they got no business in my life. And so many times it's these habits that we just don't seem to be able to break. We've tried and tried and tried. Oh, God, I'll never do that again. And then by the time you say amen, you're involved in it again. Right? Am I the only one? You know? We have those things happen. And sometimes it's just, sometimes the, the iron chariot is just excesses in our life. We spend too much money. Or we eat too much. Or we, here's one I'm seeing more and more that's just destroying people in the church. We watch too much TV news. I don't care which 
side of the political spectrum you're on, that stuff will kill you. Yeah, okay, you maybe need to know what's going on, but you, when, you, when there's an excess in it, it just consumes your mind and you're letting other people tell you what's important in the world and how you should think about it instead of saying, God, what's going on around here? What should I think about it? How should I respond to it? And it's not evil to watch TV news. But maybe it's not beneficial for you if we're taking it to an excess. You know? And so it can just be excesses of things that aren't even really bad. You know, maybe it's our responses, the way we respond, the way we were brought up. Many of us respond to situations, the way we saw our parents respond or the way we've seen other people respond. And, and maybe that's an iron chariot. We need to just break that and stop responding to situations in that way. Does that make sense? Yes. Maybe it's thought patterns. This is a big one. Thought patterns that we've just had all of our lives. You know, it's like we, maybe, we, maybe you're just a worry. Well, my family's just all worriers. We're all going to worry. I mean, somebody's got to do it, right? You know, how are things going to get better if somebody's not worrying about it, you know? And so we just always worry, 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 worry. We're always thinking of what could go wrong and how it could go wrong and how it's going to be the best. And, and we just consumed with that. And maybe that's an iron chariot in your life. And you go, oh, I know I need to stop worrying. I know I need to trust God. And the next thing you know, boom, you're back into worrying again, right? Now you're worrying because you're not worrying enough, you know? It's just this terrible, you know? Maybe it's, that, maybe it's just worrying or maybe it's just, you know, anger or somebody did you wrong and boy, you just, you mull that over your brain and it's just going over in your head and, well, this is what I should have said and I should have done that and I'll do that next time. I'm like, you know, and, you just, and, and it's just that eats you up or, or maybe somebody did something horrible to you that shouldn't have been done to anybody and, and instead of forgiving and moving on and leaving that, casting that care upon the Lord, you just, you just always think about it. Oh, and God begins to heal. And then you begin to think about it again. And oh, that was so wrong and they shouldn't have done it. And it's just like a wound that you're never going to allow to heal because you just keep mulling it over in your brain and going over and over and over it again. Maybe that's the iron chariot. Okay, I'm going I'm to stop that. I'm going to move on. I'm going I'm, I'm to forgive them. And forgiveness isn't a one-time thing. I'm going to do it again today and a day and today and today. And every time that comes up, I'm going to forgive them and I'm going to move on. And then you find yourself again just waking up and all you can think about is that wrong that was done to you or that injustice that was done to you or maybe it was done to your kid or done to your spouse or just that wrong thing that was done. Maybe somebody you don't even know, but you're taking up an offense for them and getting all offended for somebody else. And it, you just never let it heal. Maybe that's the iron chariot. You just can't seem to bring those thoughts under control. And I know many times we think, well... It's okay to think about it as long as you don't do it. That's not right. How can it be right to think about something that is wrong to do? You know, I mean, that's what Jesus said when he said, if you look at a woman in lust, you've committed adultery. If you hate your brother in your heart, you're as good as a murderer. Just because you don't do it, you've got to control those wild horses in your brain. You know, one of the early church fathers, he said, it's, it's up to us not only to subdue the animals of the field, but also those wild passions within us. We need to subdue those. We can't just let them run wild, or they will possess you. They're an enemy. They're that iron chariot that will just run you over if you allow it to. So we've got to come up against these iron chariots. And, and here's the thing. I know with many of us, we've been... We've been beat down so many times. And we've lost so many times. We've gone out and, oh, I'm going to oh, I'm gonna change. And I'm going to become different in this way. Like, and then the iron chariot just <laughs> runs right over you. And eventually you go, I'll never have a good marriage. <laughs> it's just, I'll never understand that woman. I mean, who can understand women anyway, you know? Or, <laughs> or I'll never understand my husband, you know? I'm, I'm, I give up. You know, I'm not even going to try. You know, nobody understands men. You know, he's just, he's out there in another world, you know? And... We just give up on those things or I'll never, I'm never going to get out of debt. May as well just jack up the next credit card to its max, you know, because I'm never going to get out of debt, you know. I'm, just, just gonna be, I'm never going to get a good job, you know. I'm never going to be able to start that business or do that thing that I feel like God's calling me to do. I tried five times. I keep falling flat on my face, you know, and I may as well just give it up, you know. I'm never going to have a good family. I'm never, my kids are never going to be serving God. And so I just, I just give up and go, well, whatever, you know. I'm going to try and live at peace with it. If you won't bother me, I won't bother you. We're going to grow in our strength. We're going to grow in our confidence. We're going to grow in our strength to defeat those forces in the air. Yes. And we shall defend our little island. I'm going to defend this place. I'm not going to let the enemy have control of this body and of this soul and this emotions, these wills. We shall defend this little island of ours. We're going to fight. We're going to fight. We're not going to let the enemy drag us back into slavery. We shall defend this little island of ours. 
Whatever the cost may be, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills. Whatever that problem is, wherever it may come into your life, we're going to fight. We're going to fight that thing. And we shall never surrender. And even if this island or a large part of it is subjected, subjugated, and starving, our empire beyond the seas will carry on the struggle. What he was saying is even if England falls, their colonies out there, Canada, for example, will continue the struggle. And the way I see that is like, you know, I may get beat to tar. I may just, I may just, in fighting the iron chariots, I may just get run over and have chariot marks all over my face. But no matter how messed up I may be, no matter, if I will just stay in the battle, the church of Jesus Christ is involved in this battle too. The empire across the sea, around the world, we're part of such a big thing. The church of Jesus Christ is going to continue this battle. And as long as I stay connected to the church, I may be on a litter and on a stretcher and just morphine attached to my arm at the end of this battle. But if I'm in the winning army, I'm in the winning army. Woo! I like that. You know, and it's like if my little finger, I, it, it could be smashed up and it could just be dangling there and do absolutely no good. But if it's still attached to the body, when the body wins, it wins. And I just want to tell you, if you may be so beat up in your fight and you may just fail and fall all the time, but don't leave the ship. Stay in Christ. Stay in Christ. Because it's like if I'm in the ark, I may be a mess in the ark, but I'm, I'm escaping the flood. And if I'm in Christ, I may just be barely there hanging on by my fingernails, but I'm in Christ. Amen. And I'm going to make it. So I want to encourage you, don't ever give up. No matter how many times you get knocked down, no matter how many times you fail. He says, we, even if this island is subjugated and starving, we're going to continue the struggle until, until in God's good time, the new world with all its power and might steps forth to rescue and liberate the old he's talking about the United States to step in to rescue but what I see is we've got a new world coming we got a new world and all its power and might and all of its glory there is a new heaven and a new earth coming and it is going to step in to rescue this world and this world and this world and so I can't quit fighting. I cannot give up. Never, ever give up because we know the outcome of this battle. Looking back on World War II, they didn't know the outcome. We know the outcome. So it was worth them keeping fighting. This one, we know the outcome of because we've read the end of the book, right? Yes. And we know ultimately we will win and we will survive. And I love what it says. Close with this passage, 1 John chapter 3. It says this. We are the children of God. Wow, right now it says you are the children of God. That's awesome. That's wonderful. But then I look at me and I go, this is it? No, that's not it. He says, right now you are a child of God, but it doesn't yet appear what you will be. Oh, thank God. This isn't it. I mean, there's more coming. And here's what he promises it will be. He says, for we know that we will be like him when we see him. We will see him as he is and we will be like him. We win this war. We possess this land. Eventually, eventually, if I stay in the battle, keep up the war, I may get run over by chariots left and right, and I may feel like I've never won a battle, but eventually, the kingdom of heaven is going to come. I'm going to see him as he is, and I'll be transformed, and I will be like him in all of his glorious, sinless, wonderful, please God state. So we've got to stay in the battle. So today what I want us to do is just, let's just, God, what one iron chariot, what thing do I need to just, I've given up, I've made peace with it, but I'm going to, I'm going to pick up the axe again and I'm going to go back to war with this thing. I'm not going to live at peace with this thing in my life, whether it's a habit or an attitude or a perspective or a thought pattern that we've had. I want to go back and fight the fight. I may get beat to death, but I'm still going to win in the end. And I'm going to go down swinging, you know? So let's just ask the Lord. Let's go to the Lord. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. 
Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.